You're listening to the Little Green Cheese Podcast, Episode 1. Welcome to the first episode. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about making cheese at home. A little bit about the format of this podcast. Uh, each month, we're going to have an interview with a cheesemaker. We're going to have some news snippets, and we're going to have a cheese of the episode segment, uh, which is going to be including some cheese tasting. So, on with the episode. Now, unfortunately, there are no other cheesemakers to interview except myself. So I thought, being the first episode, I would introduce myself and let you know a little bit about why I make cheese. So, as you know, my name is Gavin Weber, and um, I started making cheese back in 2009 after going on a cheesemaking course um, here in the town of Melton, Victoria, where I live. Uh, there were two lovely old ladies that uh, decided to run the cheesemaking course and they advertise it as a um, semi-hard and hard cheese-making course. So there were about 18 students uh, in, the, in the class, and everybody got to choose a different type of cheese. So I chose feta uh, for reasons that are known uh, in my cheese book, um, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, so you can have a look at that later. Um, so we ended up making feta, and uh, it turned out quite well, and we had to brine it when we got home. So I really enjoyed doing that, and I enjoyed it so much that I went out and uh, bought a cheesemaking book, um, and I tried to make a few really simple cheeses to start with, uh, and I got a bit cocky, so I made uh, feta again, and I got a bit excited and decided that I was going to make Wensleydale out of the cheesemaking book, they came with a kit that I bought at the course. Now, unbeknownst to me, the uh, process took nine hours, and I started it. It was about um, seven o'clock at night, so I didn't actually finish until about three in the morning making that first Wensleydale. But I tell you what, after it was finished, it was delicious. It was one of the best cheeses that I've ever made. So that's why and, and when I first started making cheeses. The different types of cheeses that I've made here at home, uh, obviously feta, um, mozzarella, quick mozzarella. Um, I like making that um, every few weeks uh, for sandwiches, pizzas, uh, that sort of thing. I've also made Wensleydale, as, as I've mentioned, which is a more complex um, semi-hard cheese, but it is uh, certainly delicious. And I've made Parmesan, Romano, a, uh, a Pyrenees or Osu Arati style. Uh, I've made uh, different types of farmhouse cheddars, uh, Kamina Kass, which is a cumin cheese uh, that's normally made in um, in the Netherlands, um, and many other different types of uh, of cheeses. So I, I primarily make my cheeses in uh, my normal um, kitchen, family kitchen, and the equipment and utensils that I use. Uh, basic ones that you find in the kitchen. There's no real special equipment except a cheese press that I've made and a uh, mould that I had to um, had to buy. Uh, the cheese press was uh, was quite simple to construct. It was from a kit, so I won't uh, fib there. So, uh, yeah, I had to buy the kit and you actually put the cheese press together yourself. Uh, and that's still going strong. And I've actually uh, made so many cheeses now that I have three cheese presses um, usually two are on the go uh, when I make cheese once every fortnight, maybe once every uh, every three weeks. But I certainly make cheese quite often enough that I need all those different cheese presses. So it's it's all pretty basic, as I said, um, all made in the kitchen. So some of the successes that I've had, some of the best cheeses um, have been uh, things like Wensleydale, which requires cheddaring. Some of the other cheeses, which are really simple and quick to make, like feta, are very satisfying. Um, certainly, when I make them, it only takes um, from uh, about, uh, yeah about four hours from milk to mold, uh, and then uh, you press it for another little while, and uh, and then you put it in brine, and that turns out to be a delicious cheese. It's fantastic. 
Um, but one of the simplest that simplest cheeses that I make is uh, ricotta, and that just simply needs um, four liters of milk, uh, a little bit of acid to uh, to curdle it, and uh, you simply heat it up. Uh, and you can make uh, different types of ricotta depending on how long you drain the curds for uh, during the process. So there's some uh, really simple successes. Uh, another really good um, cheese that I uh, I make is uh, kafili, which is a Welsh cheese. Um, it's heavily salted and it matures within three weeks. So it's a, it's quite a good cheese to to start with for beginners. So some of the challenges that I've had uh, for the cheeses is during uh, the aging process. One of the one of the uh, early issues that I used to have was uh, bloating. And uh, when I, whenever I'd make a large cheese from about oh, it's about fourteen liters of milk, uh, I would find that the cheese would swell up, and usually this was during the summer because when you air between um, taking the cheese out of the mold um, and before putting it into the cheese fridge, you have to let it air dry um, so you don't get as many molds when you put it into the cheese fridge. Uh, one of the troubles I was having was that the uh, it was so warm in the uh, kitchen, uh, and we're talking over twenty five degrees Celsius, that the cheese was um, was swelling and producing carbon dioxide within itself, uh, and therefore when you went to cut open the final cheese, it was just a big outer shell uh, and a compressed cheese around the skin. So uh, I solved that by when uh, I was air drying the cheese that I'd, I'd simply straight put it straight away into the cheese cave. Um, and the cheese cave, cave I've got is just simply a um, a, a wine fridge uh, that you can control the temperature between, I think it's about 10 degrees to 15 degrees Celsius. So those are some of the challenges I had. So the fa- most favourite cheese that I like to make is is kafili. It's nice and simple. It tastes delicious, uh, and it only takes well, it's about five hours from milk to mold. Uh, and uh, like I said, within three weeks, it's it's ready to to eat. So it's fabulous. Uh, one of my favourite cheeses to eat would be a very well aged parmesan. Uh, now I make parmesan probably once every three, maybe four months. And I age it for up to a year. So the cheese tastes uh, well matured. Um, it's got a sharp taste. It's got that typical Parmesan taste, uh, which which people really do enjoy, especially on uh, grated over pasta or into um, uh, all sorts of uh, or cooked dishes. Another question I've got here is, the what's my favourite drink that goes with cheese? Well, it'd have to be um, a nice tipple of uh, red wine. Uh, goes lovely with some of the stronger cheeses. With the lighter cheeses, um, I uh, I particularly like um, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, which is a, a a dry white wine. Um, and I always like a, a nice plain cracker, water cracker. So nothing with um, with too much flavour that would spoil the the flavour of the cheese. So uh, the final question I've got here for the interview is that. Uh, words of encouragement to give new cheesemakers. Well, I think that you need to either go on a cheesemaking course or you need to buy a basic uh, cheesemaking book. And there are many good cheesemaking books out there. So you just need to try some of the um, easier cheeses to make. So uh, cheeses like, you know, 30-minute mozzarella or ricotta, something really basic, uh, until you get the hang of the process and, and understand the different steps um, towards making that cheese. So give it, a, and, and my my main advice is just give it a go. What have you got to waste? Four litres, eight litres of milk, and it doesn't cost much these days. Uh, and uh, at least you can uh, not cry over your spilt milk uh, or spoiled milk, whatever that may be, and you will be able to um, make something um, um, certainly edible. So now it's time for the news. So some news that I've found around the traps. Uh, we've just uh, 
had an announcement today that uh, Fonterra Australia is going to be investing $6.6 million to upgrade their cheese production system at Wynyard in Tasmania. Um, this is partly through a grant given to them by uh, the Clean Technology Food and Foundries Investment Program, which is an Australian government program here. Um, so they're going to um, lower their energy consumption and increase production of uh, cheese at that plant. Uh, the state-of-the-art system is going to include eight new vats um, and it will be enable um, Fonterra to continue, continue to uh, deliver new cheese um, and expand uh, uh, for domestic and international customers. Uh, just a disclaimer, I, I don't belong to a Fonterra or anything like that. Um, I just think that uh, expanding cheese production in Australia is, is, is not a bad thing. Uh, it'd be better if it was artisan cheese, but it uh, just happens that uh, it's a multinational. Okay, another t- uh, news snippet here. I found a, a great article from uh, the UK um, that uh, apparently the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, or DEFRA, is seeking a public views on a bid to amend the foodstuffs protection designation of origin status. So under EU law, Stilton can only be produced in Leicestershire, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, uh, where the cheese is thought to have originated. There's an application by a cheese company and they want to make it in Cambridgeshire. So big news there in Stilton country. Uh, now, I actually do make Stilton myself here uh, in Australia. Uh, I suppose I shouldn't really call it Stilton. It's a blue cheese of Stilton flavour. There you go. That's what we should call it now. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, consultation by DEFRA for um, uh, for the public to see if they're going to let the Stilton name spill over to another village. Very exciting stuff. Uh, more on the news front. Uh, yesterday, I held a cheesemaking workshop um, at the... Uh, Roxburgh Park uh, Community Homestead. Um, my lovely wife Kim uh, accompanied me and was my assistant. Um, we had uh, eight students. It was uh, it was a really good time, and uh, those sort of cheese making workshops we do quite frequently, probably about one or two a month. So we really enjoyed this one up at uh, Roxburgh Park. Um, so keep an eye out uh, on my cheese blog, which we'll mention a little bit later. So the cheese of the month uh, this month is uh, mozzarella or 30-minute mozzarella. I had the pleasure of tasting some yesterday that some of my students made and it was probably one of the best mozzarellas that I had tasted for quite a long time. Um, I know for a fact that all the students in that class uh, took away a great mozzarella and they really enjoyed it. Um, So that's my cheese of the month and the taste, well, hmm, I suppose it was a little bit rubbery. Uh, as all good mozzarellas are, um, stringy. But when it's cooked, uh, when it's um, been freshly made, it really does have an amazing flavour. Uh, the good thing about the cheese that I teach, uh, mozzarella anyway, it really does improve with flavour overnight. So uh, the next day, the cheese is quite amazing. Uh, the taste in the mouth really does explode uh, and it gets better um, over the next two or three days. So, yeah, something to look at. If you do add lipase, uh, which is a cheese enzyme, to um, your 30-minute mozzarella recipe, then you will find that the cheese does get more intense uh, over the next few days. Uh, that's if there's enough to hang around and and last that long. Um, surely, uh, I think lots of people on that course actually ate most of their cheese um, uh, before they left the workshop. So <laughs> that was quite good fun to see that on their faces. And now I have a listener question from Pat Kirkham in the UK. Hello. I've just started to make Wensleydale cheese. I'm very, very new to the game. But I noticed that you have a large pot sitting on top of a smaller pot, not actually in the water. And I wondered, does this really work? Well, Pat, I'm glad you asked. Yes, it does work. All you need to do is put the small pot, um, put a couple of inches of water into the small pot and it acts as as a steamer 
Uh, most cheese-making factories actually do use steam to heat up their milk, so it works well and it maintains the heat if you keep the lid on top. Well, that's all we've got time for this week in this uh, podcast. Uh, for upcoming workshops, they, you can find them on littlegreencheese.com. Uh, the next cheese workshop I have is on Saturday the 1st of June, uh, 2013, and that's at the Melton South Community Centre and details are on the website. You can also purchase my cheese making ebook, uh, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home, which is available on all good ebook retailers on all formats. And uh, like I said, further details are on littlegreencheese.com. So thanks for listening to the first episode and stay, cho- stay tuned. Uh, for the next episode of Little Green Cheese Podcast where we'll feature home cheesemakers, uh, hopefully via Skype. So thanks very much for listening. Bye. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music from Kevin McLeod featuring Malt Shop Pop and the news theme. The outro was the Dairy Cow theme by Rossini.